with this. Everybody knows about the Cy Hirsch story. But when I saw it, my immediate thought was, hmm, there's a war going on. There's some people in the Pentagon saying, and they pointed specifically at the core of the neocons, Newland, Biden, Sullivan, uh, uh, um, Newland, Biden, Sullivan, and somebody else. But at any rate, the core of the new, those three right there, the core Burns. of the new, huh? Burns. Burns. Yeah, they pointed at Burns, which is interesting. They named names. Interesting when they, no names in the Pentagon. Hmm, wonder where it came from. Your thoughts, Scott Ritter. Well, again, in, in the interest of full disclosure, um, uh, Seymour Hirsch and I have known each other for almost, I mean, coming on a quarter century now. And um, I, I consider him a close personal friend, and I'd like to believe that he, um, I lost you for a second. I'd like oh, to yeah. believe. We're seeing you fine. So keep, you keep okay. going. We're seeing you perfectly <laughs> fine. Like, I told you my computer yeah. this morning was like, mm, we're not going to play. But uh, the, um, no, we're, we're close personal friends. I've known him for, um, you know, cool. Um, and uh, so I, I need to say that, that I am heavily biased in favor of Cy Hirsch. But this bias isn't uh, doesn't blind me to, you know, his. You know, I'm not somebody who says, "Oh, he won a Pulitzer Prize, therefore everything he does glows in the sun automatically." Um, what impresses me about Sai is that I have watched his work ethic over the years. Uh, because we we are friends. Um, yeah, first of all, I'll say he didn't discuss this piece with me at all. I had no knowledge this was coming. I have no insights into his sources here. But in the past, um, he has talked to me about uh, things that he'd been writing, trying to bounce things off of me, et cetera. And so I, I have firsthand experience um, in his investigative um, methodology. And I will tell you this right now. Uh, Cy Hirsch is not a single source man. Um, uh, Cy Hirsch is not a two source man. Cy Hirsch is not a three source man. Cy Hirsch has lived in Washington, D.C. forever. I think uh, when he was born, the last dinosaurs were still walking the face of the earth. Um, and <clears throat> he he has sources that people can't even begin to imagine. Um, and these are sources that, you know, I've, I've dealt with a lot of reporters in my time. And um, I've been part of stories where I had to call people up and say, where'd you get this? Um, and, you know, and it was a friend of a cousin of an uncle of an aunt of somebody who knew somebody who was there, this, that, and the other thing. And I'm like, that ain't a source. Uh, Cy Hirsch, when he says somebody who knows, <laughs> let's just say that it's somebody who knows. Um, and I'm comfortable enough to say that, uh, you know, given this man's not just track record, but the, my personal interaction with him, um, you could take this story to the bank. And, um, and, and that's just important to know, because now we come to, that's a long way of setting up what I'm about, you know, to answer your question, but um, somebody's talking uh, and you have to ask yourself, why now? Uh, why, why, why with this specificity? What is the purpose of this? And, you know, and we can, we, for, for any things we can, we can say, but I think there's a growing recognition that the Biden administration has um, not only stumbled America into a proxy conflict against Russia. We cannot win. We cannot win this. It's just a straight up say, let me make it even more clear. Should we turn this into a direct conventional conflict with Russia? We cannot win. I want people to understand that the U.S. military is incapable, at is, as it is currently configured, to defeat Russia in a large-scale ground combat in Europe. Statement of fact, I will debate Ben Hodges, any retired general. The active guys can't debate me, but I would debate any one of them too. And I would destroy them because I know their doctrine. I know their training. I know what they think they can do. And I know what they can't do. And when I confront them with this, they will have to acknowledge that I am right. Uh, they can hide behind bravado and all they, all they want. It's there. So there's a growing recognition that, you know, again, to borrow that phrase from Top Gun, your ego is writing checks your body can't cash. Well. That's sort of what Biden has been doing. But it's not just Russia. He attacked, he declared war through an act of war on a NATO ally, on a NATO ally. And he's not even hiding it. This is a man who bragged about it before it happened, along with his deputy assistant secretary of state, 
uh, Victoria Newland, piece of junk on the bottom of the ocean. Uh, you know, Victoria, you should be arrested right now and put in jail. I mean, literally, the Department of Justice should be arresting you. You are a criminal. And I know the president has some sort of qualified immunity while he's in office, but I would like to believe that uh, th this man, uh, because the, the question, did he have congressional permission to do this? It's a fundamental question, ladies and gentlemen, a fundamental question. Did he have congressional permission to do this? Did he brief Congress that he was going to engage in an act of war against a NATO ally? Did he brief them? And the answer is no. This is a crime. This is the highest crime. This is a man who has betrayed the Constitution, betrayed the trust we've given him. For what? A little ego game, a little ego boost? He destroyed the economy of Europe, and he got America caught in a proxy conflict that we're not going to win. This is a man who deserves to be arrested when he leaves office and prosecuted. Now, he's too old. I wouldn't put him in jail, but I'd place him under house arrest, and I'd put a muzzle on him for the rest of his life. He has no right to speak with any authority about America after this. This is a man who put us in harm's way for no reason. And that's the importance of the Cy Hirsch story. Because people on the inside are starting to say something isn't right in Denmark. Well, what's interesting, two things. <clears throat> I'll say this, as a person who, you know, taught lots of law enforcement and law-related things, um, there is the element of intent here. Here's why. Because what they said in their discussions is, this is an act of war. Bingo. Therefore, we got to do something to mitigate all of the things that we are constitutionally required to do. You can have no greater element of intent than someone say, what we're doing will violate the Constitution. Therefore, we have to make sure nobody finds out. That is at that point is a confession of criminal intent, of mens rea, of criminal state of mind. Yeah. No, you're you're 100% right. And this is, no one's talking about this. Everybody's talking about the Norwegian sonar buoy and the codes and the, like, the sexy stuff. Yeah. You know, ooh, it went boom. Um, nobody's talking about the frontal assault on the Constitution of the United States of America, a frontal assault carried out by the President of the United States. I mean, look, I don't want to go down uh, this rabbit hole, but I was deeply offended by January 6th for the primary reason that it was a frontal assault on the Constitution, that it was an effort to disrupt constitutionally mandated tasks of Congress under, I believe, Article, uh, I mean, under the 12th Amendment. Um, I don't want to get into the politics of, of the you know, stolen election. I don't care about that. I really don't. What I care about is that Congress was doing a job mandated by the Constitution and people sought to disrupt that. And that, to me, is the greatest crime, the greatest sin. Um, and they're trying to get, you know, President Trump, you know, linked to this because of, you know, you know, statements he made on the periphery or that may or may not have had intent. It's a worthwhile investigation. I'm not saying to come clean, but I'm saying you're putting so much effort into proving that what was Trump the one that the trigger man. Biden is the trigger man. He is the trigger man. He's the guy on the, we now know who's on the grassy knoll. We now know who shot Kennedy. It's Biden. Biden is the assassin. He assassinated the Constitution. He assassinated um, you know, what makes America great. And there's silence right now. I would hope that, you know, I don't believe, I, I think it's unhealthy for this country to be split into Republican and Democrat. All right. But what goes around comes around. And if the Democrats wanted to play political war going after Trump, which is their right, I'm not saying they're, they're it's, they have no right to do it. They have a right to do it. But that was a game. That was a that was sort of a witch hunt kind of thing, um, trying to manufacture a case from circumstantial evidence. Hey, Republicans, there ain't nothing circumstantial about this. You have dates. You have names. You have every subpoena them. Get them before Congress. Demand access to the documents and put people in jail. Jake Sullivan should be frog marched out of the White House, put straight into prison. So should William Burns. So should anybody in this con uh, conversation. I know the president can't because he's the president, but it's time maybe then that the Democrats go up to him like the Republicans did to Nixon and say, you need to step aside, Mr. President, because you did something very, very bad. You violated the Constitution of the United States, the document that defines who we are and what we are, and we can't let that happen. Remember, this isn't about Biden. 
This is about the office of the presidency. This is about America. And if we let this man get away with this crime, then that office means nothing. It means nothing. The Constitution means nothing. This country means nothing. This is a big deal. And Cy Hirsch deserves every accolade anybody can put on him. You know, uh, like I said, so many people are focused on the minutia of the attack, which he's laid out in great detail. I mean, it's a fascinating story. And, and you and I both know that if you're going to try and put an argument out, you got to make it interesting. Right. All right. So we got the Tom Clancy aspect of this. I mean, we were there, you know, with the divers putting the explosives down in the airplane, dropping the sonar buoy. But the most important place to be is in the White House. Right. Where Joe Biden colluded with his national security advisor and his CIA director to violate knowingly, willingly, with intent uh, beforehand to, to, to violate the Constitution of the United States of America. And not just in a little way to attack a long-standing NATO ally. If I were Germany, I'd, I'd kick out the American ambassador, I'd withdraw uh, our, their ambassador, and I'd tell America, we have a problem. We have a serious problem. And until you come clean about what happened here, we don't have relations with you anymore because you're the enemy you attack. This was an economic Pearl Harbor for, for Germany. They oh, yeah. suffered. Yes. I mean, you, you, people, do you understand... Besides, the, you know, we quantify Pearl Harbor in terms of lives lost. But frankly, in the big picture of World War II, nothing. The economic impact of Pearl Harbor, the amount of money that was damaged, sunk, had to be rebuilt, etc., is less than what we did to Germany by blowing up the Nord Stream 2. We literally carried out an economic Pearl Harbor, a surprise attack against the critical energy uh, infrastructure of someone that we claim to be our close friend, our NATO ally. We carried out a Pearl Harbor. We, a country that every December 7th talks about a day that will live in infamy. Well, I'm here to tell you right now, that day in September when we blew up Nord Stream, that should live in infamy in the minds of everybody around the world. And the center isn't Imperial Japan. The center is the United States of America. There's something else here that I think I'd like to get your take on. And this is critical. And this is a great metaphor for NATO, for NATO and the U.S. protecting um, uh, uh, Europe. They literally used a NATO military exercise <laughs> where they were practicing protecting NATO, including Germany, from a Russian attack. Right. So right. they're like, let's do this Baltic Sea, Balt right. Ops 22. We're going to practice that way. We can protect you guys from a Russian attack. They use that as cover to launch a military attack against one of the countries that was involved in the exercise. Two things. It's a great metaphor for everything that's going on with NATO claiming to protect um, they claimed to protect Germany from an economic attack by Russia because Russia was going to use gas. They claimed to protecting Germany from a military attack by Russia. Everything they claimed to be uh, 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 protecting Germany from, they used it as a cover yeah. to yeah. attack Germany. Yeah. And, you know, let's, let's, let's not forget about Norway. Little old Norway. Um, was this the case of a, the, you know, a weak Norwegian government unable to stand up to the book? Or was it Norway saying, wow, if you blow up Nord Stream 1 and 2 and we open up our own gas pipeline uh, from Norway to Poland, maybe we'll enable Poland to be able to uh, resell gas to Germany and make a profit and a living for us and the Poles. And, there. I mean, and again, Germany has to go, well, who gets the short end of the stick on this one? Us again. Us again. Germany needs to understand that they have become the laughing stock, the whipping post um, for the United States and the European Union. I mean, I get Germany. <laughs> I'm sorry. They 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 deserve everything they have coming for, for them. I, I I don't mean that. Uh, you know, I mean I don't mean to be too mean, but you know, when you when you play stupid, when you play dumb, when you play weak, um, stupid, dumb, weak things happen to you. Yeah, I mean, everybody knows that the old keep the Russians out, keep the Germans down, keep the Americans. Out. Everybody knows that, including the Germans. And if you're willing to accept that. The other thing is, and here's another great irony. The Germany clearly has a quisling government. 
And they were literally attacked by the country, Norway, who gave us the term Quisling. The, at this point, if you're a German, <laughs> good point. <laughs> you got to look at your government. What? It, there's two things going on here. The position they put the Germans in. What are the German people do? Do they just keep waving their blue and yellow flags? Or do they say, wait a minute, I can't afford to buy the things I could. My lifestyle, my culture, everything's being wiped out. And Annalena Baerbach told them. She said it was coming. She said, eh, you know, we're going to do this. I don't care what the German people have. What kind of a country is Germany now? The world is looking at Germany with disdain. The world is looking at Germany with pity to say, you people are looking at your government betray you. And you're running around with a blue and yellow flag begging for it. I, I mean, this is pretty sick, uh, Scott. Yeah, I mean, Germany stands for nothing, literally. Um you know, on the it one falls hand, for they, anything. <laughs> pardon? they stand for nothing and fall for anything. Forever. You know, they, they, this is a nation that literally, you know, was born on the, con, uh, you know, on the concept of never again. Right. I mean, they are lucky to be around the Morgenthau plan uh, that was envisioned at the end of the second world would have broken them up uh, into constituent parts, would have destroyed their industry uh, so they could never get militarized. Uh, they dodged that bullet. Um, they now were given the opportunity to reunify. Um, they have a strong economy, but again, never again means not just you don't get to go around killing Jews. Never again means you never get to breathe life into the very ideology that led to you killing Jews to begin with. This militarized, the nexus of militarism and nationalism um, with this, I, I guess it's a DNA, uh, you know, imbued urge to march eastward against Russia. Um, you know, you don't get to send tanks made from German steel and named after cats to Ukraine to kill Russians. You don't get to do that. You have no right. You have no moral authority, especially when the government that you're sending these tanks to is a Nazi government. Stepan Bandera is the national hero, and Bandera and his banderists were supported by the Galen organization that controlled them during the Second World War on the behalf of Adolf Hitler, and then transferred that control to the CIA, the same Nazi people controlling Nazis, but on this, in, in this case, on behalf of the United States, and that's, that's where they're at right now. Germany is, and, and I know Germans get mad at me, and I don't care. Prove me wrong. You're a Nazi country. Scratch a German, find a Nazi. Because if you're not laying down on railroad tracks, preventing those tanks from going to to um, to, to to Ukraine, if you're not surrounding uh, Rhine, or, you know, um, I, I think it's uh, Rhine Metal AG, the, the the one of the places that build these tanks, and preventing any activity taking place, getting the workers out and into the streets, saying we will not do this, never again, never again. But the Germans aren't. They're like, oh, we can't do anything. Our hands are tied. No, you know whose hands were tied? The Germans who opposed Adolf Hitler. Their hands got tied before they got strung up by the neck until dead. Okay, don't tell me your hands are tied because they're not more tied than the people who stood up to Adolf Hitler. And you need to stand, stand up to the ideology that is derived from that sick tendency to militarize and march east. And then on top of that, they, you know, if you're going to do that, then you have to say, I'm part of a NATO, you know, community. We are one with the NATO community. We're one with America. Well, they got screwed with their attitude. I'm sorry, the bad language <laughs> going into, uh, into Ukraine. And they just got screwed by the Americans. They got screwed on both ends. Um, this is, you know, Germany is just a, there's another word I can't use, but it's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm with, it, you know what I'm going to say. But, uh, I, I, yeah, you know, and that's what they are. They are that, uh, and it's accurate. and um, and at some point in time, you gotta, you can't continue to feel sorry for them. You can't I agree. continue to feel sorry for them. At some point in time, the guilt becomes so manifest that there's no pity. There's just disgust and disdain. I agree with you there. Um, what, what we need to talk about next is um, something we discussed: the offense, the offensive in 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 uh, in. Um, uh, in Eastern Ukraine, it seems to me it's kicking off. It seems to me that it's kind of uh, 
you know, not they they're, they're not OK. Let's just make the grand blitzkrieg attack seems to be a different kind of thing. But I, it seems to be a heavy lean that's coming, you know, rather than wham, just putting the heavy pressure on them. And that pressure, man, is, is, you know, I've always said this. People ask me about what makes you tired. You've played basketball. I played basketball uh, my whole life. And they say, what makes you tired? And I, all the running, I go, no, 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 no. Running doesn't make you tired playing basketball. When you stand out of the rim and some really big guy leans against you yeah. and you get out of the way and then he le and some guy who's huge and he just leans against you because I don't care how long he, he doesn't get tired. But that weight just wears you down. You can run and run and run. But if some big guy leans on you about five minutes into that, you're looking for some water, some Gatorade. You're looking for a place to sit down. And it appears that's the kind of thing that they're doing. A, a, a heavy lean on the forces until the forces crumble. We'll do about five minutes and then we'll jump over to Rockfin. Your thoughts? No, you're 100% correct. Look, that's exactly what's happening. Is this the offensive? No. Um, is this part of the offensive? Yeah. Uh, in the military, you shape the battlefield. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you don't allow the enemy to define the battlefield. You define the battlefield. And in a situation where an enemy is dug in uh, and, and thinks they're in control, you need to change that dynamic. And you do so by applying pressure. And you apply pressure where you choose to apply pressure. And you compel the enemy to respond to you, the OODA loop. You yeah. Orient observe, orient, decide, act. Um, and that's what the Russians are doing now. They're getting inside the Ukrainian OODA loop, inside their decision-making cycle. They're, you know, acting and the Ukrainians are reacting. There's no, the Russians aren't responding to the Ukrainians. The Ukrainians are responding to the Russians. And look, I mean, I know that you can go on Telegram and you can see that the 155th Brigade launched an attack against Uladar and they lost eight vehicles and they had to withdraw. Hey, welcome to war, guys. Right. You know, it ain't all sunshine and roses. Um, things go good and things go bad. And even when things go good, you die. But people are like, that's a failed attack. And I'm like, really? Do you, were you there with the objective? You know, in the, in, in Desert Storm, uh, the 1st Cavalry Division launched an attack up the Wadi al-Batin before the big left hook. And the idea of the attack was to let the make the Iraqis think that that's where the action's coming. And we lost some vehicles and we lost some men. Um, and the attack, you know, went in and then, and then came back and the Iraqis were like, we beat them, we beat them, we beat them. But what that attack did is freeze the, uh, Republican guard divisions that were along the Wadi Alba team, froze them in place so that they couldn't react to the left hook. And then the left hook came along and ended up sweeping them away. So all the guys are sitting there going, oh, the Russians just, just got beat at Uladar. I'm like, first of all, it's a battle, not the war. Second of all, you don't know what the intent of that was. We do know that the Ukrainians are pouring reserves into Uladar. And what you want to do is keep those reserves there and attract more. So maybe this was one of those attacks where they said, hey, punch in as far as you can, commit, and then come out. And you know what's tough about those? You're going to lose tanks and you're going to lose men. And it's going to suck for those guys in those tanks and the men that got killed. But from an operational perspective, you went in and you grabbed the enemy. You held on to You leaned into him, as yep. you say. Put that weight and, on him. And, and now that you pull back, but they are now committed. They are committed. And because you attacked there, they can't leave. They are trapped in that location. And then let's watch what happens up and down the flanks. People who talk about a single battle in a single day simply don't know anything about warfare, modern warfare, large-scale ground combat. Um you know, and, and this is going to happen again. The Russians are going to suffer losses. There will be times when they launch an attack that they think will succeed, and it won't because the Ukrainians will defend. Welcome to war. This is what happens. You know, but a professional military force goes in there, bam, gets hit. Okay, back off. Bam, gets hit again. And then you come in, you finally find the weak spake. You worse the body, and then you knock them out. And the Russians are in the problem. And the other thing is the Russians, they're just jabbing right now. <laughs> The haymakers right here, baby. <laughs> it, yeah. ain't, it ain't been committed yet. And the Ukrainians are putting up both fists and coming at it. The, the knockout blow is coming. It's going to be decisive, and it's going to be over for, for the Ukrainians. All right. We're jumping over. Something else I want to 